We are those guys. You hear the music. It is Patriots Dynasty time. He's Nick Ferguson. I'm a Christmas tree. Just looking at this color combo here right now. Uh, I'm Alex Hardy. We're those guys. We hope to be your guys. If you're just finding us, hit pause. Stop. Go back to our earlier editions of Patriots Dynasty. We're up to episodes 5 and 6 as we are watching the Patriots transition from a Super Bowl loss to, you know, looking on the bright side, Bill Belichick says. We were 16-0. and Let's build off of that. Nick Ferguson, you are leaving the Jets in 2008 and heading to the Houston Texans. Can you talk about joining a new team, leaving that division that Tom Brady has commanded for the last, you know, near decade at this point, um, kind of your situation as you are, you know, advancing in your own NFL career? Well, one thing about it, man, I mean, I played against a lot of quarterbacks, Tom Brady and the Patriots were thrown in my side, backside as though so many others, but you never really get away from Tom Brady and, and the Patriots. I mean, it's like that pet stain. Uh, in the corner that you scrub and you spray and you scrub some more and you can't really get out of it because when you look over in the corner, it still reminds you of what it used to be. And that's kind of what it's been like. It was like playing against Tom Brady and the Patriots. You, you never really get away from them because, I mean, they were still playing at a high level even at that point. Well, of course, they were 16-0. and They hit the field week one against Kansas City and they're looking to you know, they're looking to correct the mistake that was that Super Bowl. Uh, however, the Kansas City Chiefs and Bernard Pollard, the safety, had other plans. Um, hits Brady in the lower left leg, his plant leg, and it tore his ACL, knocked him out for the season. Nick, you played with Bernard Pollard in Houston. Did he ever talk about this situation with Tom? Was it a source of pride, or are you guys competitors and you don't want to see anybody getting hurt? Well, Bernard, and he, if you know anything about him, he was a physical type of safety. That's just kind mm-hmm. of was in his mentality. That's the way he played. He was a competitor, but it was one of those things that he was a part of NFL history because it was against Tom Brady and the Patriots. Right. But it was something that he wore on his shoulder like a badge of honor. It was something that happened. They will be forever linked together. Patriots fans will forever dislike Bernard Pollard, even it's years true. later. It's true. Uh, but it was just kind of one of those things, and he didn't really talk about it that much, and we didn't really ask him about it that much because you got to think about it. It is tough on both sides. I mean, Brady goes out. Uh, it seemed like uh, the fortunes of the Patriots are now gone, and then now Bernard Pollard is the poster child of, hey, that guy hurt Brady. So no one wants to really talk about it, but we just knew uh, the history and how he uh, impacted the Patriots. Well, you talk about the history, and Tom knows full well about how he came into his position as the starting quarterback of the New England Patriots. We covered that in depth in earlier episodes while we were watching Dynasty. Make sure to check those out if you haven't yet. And we're only seven years removed from Drew Bledsoe going down against you and the New York Jets. And so he's having those insecurities seeing a seventh-round Matthew Castle take over, um, a guy who sits down. For the in the documentary for the first time, which is you know kind of the next transition of that era, and he talks about he wasn't a high he the last game he started was in high school sitting behind Carson. Um, and so look at the time you're at this inflection point where people have to ask, look, is this Bill Belichick's success? Is this Tom Brady's success? Something that we probably still haven't figured out uh, 20 years later, Nick. No, you know, it's funny that you you mentioned that, and that's something that every player goes through because uh, the idea is that starter doesn't lose his job to injury. That was Mm. the biggest lie that I was told entering to the league because if the backup goes in, he plays well, they're going to go with the hot hand. That's kind of how it is, and and Brady – but once again, like you said, he's been in that situation. He knows what it's like. And I think that added to his competitive drive, trying to get back on the field far too early and causing somewhat of an infection in his leg. But that's who we are. I mean, that's who I mean, 
this this whole gladiator thing that uh, we are associated with as as athletes, and that that's who we are. That that's kind of our makeup. Now, I will say this: not every single player shares the approach of a Tom Brady because some guys just want to be on the team just for the sake of being on the team. But, oh, so you're saying that not everybody wants to play 23 years in the National Football League, Nick? No, no. There's some guys who just want to say that I'm on the roster, right, just to tell their family and friends, say, hey, I play in the NFL. I don't really play, but I'm on the roster. Mm-hmm. But Tom wasn't no, one of those types of individuals. He wanted to get out there and play. More importantly, he knew how valuable it was for him to be out there and, and playing and having a coach like Bill Belichick who can change like a, a donut box in a windstorm, you want to make sure that you are always on the field to show what you can do. Well, credit Matt Castle. He enters a 0-0 game, and they pull out that victory against the Chiefs. And, Nick, we saw this in 2001, week two. There's just there's nothing like a New York Jets team to step in and give confidence to a young Patriots quarterback. <laughs> Castle goes in and dispatches the, the, uh, the Jets as well. Um, during this time... And I kind of want to go back to your comment about the uh, infection that Tom Brady, you're saying that because he tried to rush back onto the field, he caused an infection in that knee that created the setback, right? Yes, exactly. That's exactly what happened because, once again, when, when you are an undrafted player or you're taken in the sixth round, which is basically an undrafted player, you know what the odds are stacked against you and you know what it means to get out there and compete. And Tom was that person. He tried to get out there far too early to prove to himself and the team that he was ready to go, but he created somewhat of an infection that only set him back even further. Well, in in steps to the first time that we see him in the documentary, uh, Alex Guerrero, Brady's personal trainer, and basically the question that he was dealing with for Tom, will, will that knee ever be the same again? It's 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 obviously a physical, but the mental aspect of it as well. Um, Nick, you're one of the fortunate ones. You've played through plenty of injuries, but you haven't had the type that you, you lost an entire season over, right? You you've missed games, but maybe the mentality of am I the same player? Can I do the same things on this knee? Um, you know, Brady's wondering if he can do that again. The mental of it has to be that much more complicated once you're cleared by medical professionals and the physical part, you just try to go out and do it. But mentally, there's, there's, there's a block in there. But then we start to see the scales kind of tip in this Belichick versus Brady dynamic. The scales tip towards Belichick because they're winning games. Well, you know what? In a lot of these cases, from a fan standpoint and the media standpoint, the skill always tips in the coach's favor because some fans feel as though, well, the name on the front is more important than the name on the back. I've been a long Patriots fan for 40 plus years, but Mm -hmm. in that time period, how well did the Patriots play? Not too well. And the one thing that I I would say when it looks at, you know, the, the, the kind of trying to decide, well, who gets more credit for a lot of those victories? I think it's twofold, but more importantly, the guy that's on the field throwing the passes. Yeah. I mean, you got to give that guy a credit because he's actually delivering the throws. He's taking the shot. So you give the coaching staff and Bill Belichick their credit, but you were starting to see it was a tipping point where it was just like, is it Brady or is it Bill Belichick? And I think it was uh, Danny Amendola saying, look, I mean, we played for the Patriots, but we played for Tom. And, and that's really what it is. I want to go back for just a second. Yeah, of course. You were talking about Ryan Mallon and, and, and um, going in. and uh, Oh, Matt playing. Castle. Yeah, yeah. Not, not Ryan Mallon. I mean, Matt Castle going in for Tom and playing. What they did for Matt Castle was something that I thought was smart. And it was part of the Patriots' way. And this is one thing I loved about what the Patriots and Bill Belichick would always do. They would always focus on what the player can do opposed to what he can't do. So that's why Castle went out there and performed well, and everyone said, you know, hey, Brady is a system quarterback. Mm -hmm. I can tell you right now, looking around the NFL, in today's game, there are a lot of coaches who are so fixated on themselves and just their system, they're unwilling to acquiesce 
to the players that they have, but that was one of the reasons why Castle actually excelled because they catered to the skill set. Well, we see, you know, there are, I'd say we're in the minority now of teams that are focused on their system and finding players that fit it. But back in 2008, how many teams outside of Bill Belichick's Patriots were accommodating for the players that they had on the roster? I feel that 15 years ago, we're talking about a National Football League where you're right. We sided with coaches and they built systems and they were just trying to plug players in. We didn't have too many examples of what Belichick was doing at the time, did we? Where he was catering the offense, or Josh McDaniels rather was catering the offense to the skills that his quarterback had. No, you had you had a handful who were doing that, but a majority of those coaches in the league at that time who were called the plays, they were just designing plays based on where they had been previously, who they had learned under. Right. Because bad bad and good habits are hard to break, and sometimes when you've been doing something for so long you get really fixed and solid in that particular position. And that was something that was happening around the league, but that was kind of the lure of getting players who were cast-offs from other teams and they were older players for playing with the Patriots because they understood, hey, listen, there's going to be more yelling and screaming because that's kind of what Bill Belichick does and not in a lot of uh, guys being held accountable, but – you knew that you were going to be put in a position to succeed because they were basing things around your ability. I say that's a genius. And I'll tell you this, that genius word is tossed around too much in the NFL. Sure. And too many, too many coaches receive that title without officially earning it. That's right. Um, Bill Belichick, however, had cultivated decades of work before being in the limelight to where we call him a genius. And that all yeah. begins with – the next step in the documentary, which is to go back to Bill's childhood and learning under uh, Navy coach Steve Belichick and following his dad around. It was wonderful to see, um, you know, to see Bill's mom talking about it and really just the impact that surrounds Bill's childhood at the Naval Academy. Um, you know, that, that sort of gives credence to Dante Stallworth's quote from the documentary, most coaches in the NFL are coaching football but Bill's coaching warfare, right? And part of that was received by Matt Castle talking about getting better and understanding the criticism that Bill would give even in a win, right? Um, I think my favorite quote from Matt Castle, this documentary, uh, he, missed a, he missed a corner blitz, and Bill says to Matt, why don't you write, uh, I don't want to have to write a letter to your mother that says, yeah. sorry your son is dead because he's a dumbass and couldn't recognize the corner blitz. That's a level of coaching that maybe uh, inspired Dante Stallworth to call out warfare. Well, that's kind of right out of the page of the military when you think about it, right? That That's usually what those in the military have to do, write those letters and those so-called training accidents that that took place so with belichick growing up around his dad i mean that's kind of where that mentality came from now we haven't seen it so far and i don't maybe we see it or not but that is where the coaching under uh bill parcells actually comes in i can sure. personally tell you yes having exactly, played for parcells uh how parcells would think it was almost it's almost it's directly from the bill parcells playbook yeah, you're looking in a mirror with those two sometimes. A a a absolutely. So when you think about Bill Belichick and him growing up and developing as a young coach to the point of seeing him just kind of change the culture with the Patriots, that's where it all started. I mean, thinking about his early introduction to the game with his father, but then the carryover to the education coaching under Bill Parcells. So with this 11-5 and five Patriots team with Matt Castle, to this day, uh, you know, in 2024, Nick, is that still the best example that we have of Bill Belichick's greatness as a coach, just barring everything else that he's done with his career, that he was 11-5 and five with Matt Castle during that Tom Brady injury plague season? Well, yeah, you give Bill Belichick uh, a lot of credit because he's the guy in charge, but... Really, if we're really going to talk about this uh, 
in a realistic way, be transparent. I think a lot of credit should be given to Joshua Daniels, to be totally honest, because he was the guy who was leading the office at the time. Now, Bill may say, hey, listen, what can we do to help, you know, Matt Castle excel in our offense, knowing as though we don't have Tom Brady, but also instill a level of confidence that in the guys in the locker room. And it was Josh McDaniels' job to carry that out, give those plays, call those plays for Matt Castle. And some of those times, you know, Matt Castle was calling his own play himself. Like, hey, he knew he was a mobile quarterback. Mm-hmm. He knew he was able to run a lot more than Tom was. And that helped change their offense because when you have a mobile quarterback, it changes how – other defensive teams try to actually defend you. So they play to their strengths and credit to Josh McDaniels. So the 2009 season is underway. Brady is back and you compartmentalize everything that's being said about Belichick, the genius, Tom Brady, the system quarterback. Um, But it's been, it's been over a year, Nick, you know, he hasn't thrown passes in a game since that Bernard Pollard hit. And before that, you have to go back to February of 2008, where he's in a Super Bowl. So there's some rust that needs to be shaken off. But just like we've seen time and time again, the Patriots were down double digits with five minutes to go. They get back-to-back touchdowns from Ben Watson, who is also good on offense, not just on defense, stopping what would be pick six touchdowns. But that was in the past. We talked about that already. Uh, Tom may have been returning to form, but now it's the defense that has its issues because they're struggling to replace the Patriots from the first three Super Bowl championships. Teddy Bruschi, Mike Vrabel, and Rodney Harrison, who were there for the last two. And all of a sudden, you know, I'm kind of taking notes and making sure we have what we want to talk about. And the 2009 season is over. We're in the wild card and I look up, and Ray Rice is just gashed the Patriots for an 82-yard touchdown. Um, I, I, I just remember it as clear as day. And it's the first wild card game loss that they've had with Brady under center. And so the emphasis is getting this team better on both sides of the ball. And what we're about to do as we transition to Episode 6 is talk about Aaron Hernandez, who obviously was a talented football player, had his issues that many of which came to light after he was found guilty of murdering Odin Lloyd, other, you know, a double homicide shootings, just um, a a terrible, terrible individual who happened to be gifted at football. And the Dynasty documentary is about to do 35 minutes on Aaron Hernandez. And, you know, there are some concerns that I have that this documentary is less about the football But I completely understand that telling this Patriot story, you have to include Aaron Hernandez, you have to include Spygate, but to devote five minutes on back-to-back Super Bowl titles compared to 35 minutes on Aaron Hernandez is a little incongruent for me uh, as a fan, but I think after we're coming off of the success, and you use that, that, that G word, genius word for Bill Belichick, we start finding issues kind of undermining the success that he's had to this point, Nick. I don't know how you feel about taking this detour from the football to talk about Aaron Hernandez. Well, I know it's very difficult for every fan, especially Patriots fans, to hear about this chapter, but this was part of it. You can't talk about the Patriots and what they were able to do without mentioning Aaron Hernandez going back to the decision that was made to actually draft him, knowing as though there were a couple of red flags. But the idea was that, hey, listen, his ability would supersede anything that he could have done at Florida. And this whole Odin Lloyd thing, no one really saw that coming. Maybe a guy who was having his uh, internal issues, but maybe not to this particular uh, magnitude. And something that was pointing out, and I do believe that it's true because – You go back to Florida where there was an incident at the bar and you look at Urban Meyer and how they were able to get Hernandez out of that situation. That points to, I mean, the role in the, the, I guess, the wrong direction, making him feel as though, wow, this happened and now I can get out of it because of this. And people will always look to help me because of my athletic ability. It's like 
the rearing of children, if you make false promises and you don't follow through on your discipline, they're going to test the, the fences. They're going to say, okay, well, my dad is full of hot air. They're not going to do anything. But that also spoke to the difference in philosophies from Robert Kraft to that of Bill Belichick. And that said a lot about the inner turmoil that was going on within the organization that no one on the outside didn't know until now. It's interesting because you take that that risk, right? There was reports at the time that they mentioned in the documentary that he was completely off of other teams' draft boards, uh, whereas Ernie Adams, who was really candid, I mean, in 2024, talking about um, Aaron Hernandez, that he was a first-round talent to them, that they were able to pick up in the fourth round. And after getting uh, Devin McCourty in the first round, Rob Gronkowski in the second round, uh, and shout out Zach Robinson, the Falcons' offensive play caller and coordinator, uh, a seventh-round pick of theirs. Um, so football can be you know, a career, even if it doesn't work out playing on the football field. But they were so focused on winning, and I think that's the thread that the documentary is trying to tie, that whether it's Spygate in episode three compared to Aaron Hernandez now rearing his head in episode six, that the Patriots and under Bill Belichick, that's kind of what we're getting at, right? Bill Belichick was willing to do whatever it took to win football games. And as much as it was part of the success, it's also his most fatal flaw. Yeah, it was. And sometimes in coaching, there's a tendency to overthink things. And like I told you before, having fixed viewpoints. And when you look at the Aaron Hernandez situation, that's exactly you know what happened. And Hernandez was excelling at one part of his life, and that was his professional life. But his off-the-field life was a, a little bit chaotic. But you have to ask yourself, okay, well, how many players in that locker room should have noticed it? How many did notice it mm -hmm. but decided to not pay attention to it because, hey, we're all grown men. We all have our own lives. And the fact that Hernandez was in Bristol, that's the part that didn't really help him, right? Because it helps to be outside of your environment, but knowing as though he was only hours away from where he mm -hmm. grew up and a troublesome you know, neighborhood or area, and now you're linking up with your old friends because guess what? One of us made it. Now you're the talk of the town. We all made it. Guy. Right. So, so you made it. We made it. And with that being said, there is uh, a part of this that speaks beyond the whole Aaron and Anders thing where you have guys who are still loyal to uh, the streets and the areas that they came from because they can't escape that particular life because they feel as though they owe people something. You don't owe them a damn thing. You're the one that made it out. And this was kind of a, a situation when I think it, it's part, you know, what Hernandez went through, but also his surroundings kind of overtaking him opposed to his dedication and loyalty to his team and organization who took a chance on it. Well, we'll talk about, you know, you hinted at what some of the players saw, but as far as Bill Belichick and Robert Kraft, what they saw was, um, you know, Belichick was coaching a team that was in need of offensive firepower. Randy Moss separates his shoulder. So in response, McDaniels and Belichick craft this offense around a pair of rookie tight ends, and they finish with a 14-2 and two season. Um, you know, you talk about Robert Kraft and he took on a role as a paternal figure for Aaron Hernandez, who lost his father at a young age that kind of created this, this spiraling downward because that was the man that kept him in line and kept his priorities straight. And, you know, the donation to it, Myra, Myra, um, you know, uh, uh, Mr. Kraft's late wife had passed just a year ago. So donating to her foundation out of his own pocket um, you know, re returning some of the signing bonus that he had on his contract extension was a big gesture for Robert Kraft to sort of look over may what may have been happening underneath and maybe off the field. And oh, by the way, the Patriots go back to another Super Bowl. But again, in Dynasty, we're not really going to focus on that. Anyway, back to Aaron Hernandez. What was bubbling underneath should have potentially had more play than 
their success on the football field or the donation to the Meyer Craft Foundation. But Brennan Lloyd, who joins the team in 2012, um, was, was warned by Wes Welker about the perils of having your lockers between Aaron Hernandez and Rob Gronkowski and the kind of disgusting behavior and language that Hernandez would subject you to. Um, and in steps Wes Welker. He's been on the team for four years at this point. He was there in 2007. He was there for 2011. But the first time we see Wes Welker in this documentary is to talk about Aaron Hernandez, which I thought was kind of a surprise. But he says that after trying to take him under his wing, being his vet, playing in multiple places, and earning his keep after being an undrafted player, um, for everything he tried to do, he just couldn't help Hernandez. And um, Dion Branch's perspective was great as well, um, talking about more of the players that had the warning signs living across the street from Aaron Hernandez and kind of seeing things that would happen in his domestic life. Um, you know, but he sort of took on this burden um, to be responsible for him and kind of as his keeper, uh, just the closest with him. And maybe, Nick, you have examples, certainly not in the case of, you know, an Aaron Hernandez, but if you have a guy that's kind of mercurial or not necessarily with the program quite as much as you may have been, you know, Branch just had this burden put on him by the coaching staff that if there were any issues with Aaron Hernandez, they didn't talk to Aaron Hernandez. They just asked Dion, like, hey, is, is he good? And that was it. But this is where the aiding and the betting took place. Right. For Bill Belichick, he didn't want to know. Right. All yeah. he wanted to know based on what he was doing on the field. And at that point, Hernandez was doing a lot on the field. So that's the only thing that Bill cared about. As it pertains to Robert Kraft, you talked about the, the, the gesture to uh, his wife and donating the money and taking him under his wing. Once again, I mean, we all know our friends and our kids and family members who are doing, you know, not so good things that go against the, the ethics of the family or even society itself, we all know who those individuals are. Mm -hmm. I mean, Belichick didn't want to know. Kraft, you know, to his credit, he didn't want to know, but he was unaffected by it because he was thinking about being that surrogate parent for Aaron Hernandez. And as, as a parent, you don't want to see the worst in your kid. Right. And because of, of that, I'm not going to blame them and say, well, they were the fault of what happened to Odin Lloyd because that's solely on the shoulders of Aaron Hernandez. But if they tried to look at some of the early warning signs, maybe they would have been able to push him in a different direction. The biggest thing was when things had reached the tipping point, Aaron, Aaron Hernandez knew that he was in the thick of it and things were about to collapse. Yeah. He asked for a trade. Why are you asking for a trade? Because now you're trying to leave and vacate the area of madness that you created. And Belichick said, no, I'm not, I'm not doing it. Yeah. Right. Would that have changed Hernandez? If he was shipped out to Seattle or somewhere else? No, because you are who you are. And it's proved since his days at Florida, that, that inner turmoil was inside of him. And it's unfortunate that his teammates couldn't help him work through it. Well, you mentioned the trade request, and I thought the documentary, that was really the first leap of faith that I saw that was really beyond the scope of what actually happened because Bob Holler, who's been an investigative reporter for the Boston Globe for decades and you know had done great work surrounding this um, Aaron Hernandez case, it, he essentially implies that Hernandez wanted to be traded, Belichick says no, what happens if Belichick says yes? Could could, could Bill Belichick could have been the one to prevent the murder of Odin Lloyd? And I'm saying to myself, like, this is not, it's not, it's not realistic. It's, 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 you know, you can, you can have criticisms of aiding and abetting, aiding and abetting like you, like you said, Nick, but to think that the life of Odin Lloyd was in Bill Belichick's hands, I think personally was irresponsible of the documentary to imply. Um, yeah. it, it's, it's, ju it's just how I feel, but that's where they really took, I think, I don't know, a creative license and, and, and wrote a check that they couldn't cash, Nick. Well, yeah, I mean, it's not Robert Kraft's fault. It's not Bill Belichick's fault because, hey, listen, they, they were not the ones that ended Odin Lloyd's life and attempted to cover it up. 
could they have done some things different differently? Yeah, they, they could. Hindsight is always twenty twenty. But let's be realistic about what we're actually talking about. Based on Aaron Hernandez's troubled past, I mean, it could have been Odin Lloyd in Seattle, in Las yeah. Vegas, somewhere else. It could have been yeah. someone somewhere else because Hernandez was a ticking time bomb and that no one decided to put the fuse out. And I know how difficult it is. You mentioned with Wes Walker. When a young guy comes into the league, he listens to some of the veterans. Once that player, and this is not, I'm, I don't want to generalize, but this happened with some players, when they start getting that taste of success, people calling their last name on their jersey, cheering them, that power has a tendency to change a lot of people, not for the better, but for the worse. And then you add a troubled pass into the mix. It was just a recipe uh, for disaster. But I'll tell you, I did notice something. As they were talking about Aaron Hernandez and this whole situation, they didn't talk to Tom Brady. We didn't see Brady. No. We didn't see a Rob Gronkowski, a guy whose locker was right next to him, and they shared the same room. So the first thing I thought was, why didn't those two guys speak? Because one of those guys, being Rob Gronkowski, probably knew Aaron Hernandez better than anyone. Sure. Uh, It's... It's, it's, yeah, I mean, based, you know, the, the common thread that I have is that both Brady and Gronk are still working with the National Football League as both broadcasters for Fox. Um, you know, the people that were candid about Aaron Hernandez no longer had official roles with the Patriots or with the National Football League. It was Ernie Adams that I mentioned, you know, the other players we brought up. Um, Wes Walker is a coach, but as far as the Patriots are being, um, you know, a face or a, an extension, a talking piece from the National Football League, I think there are legitimate concerns about who was allowed to speak, who wanted to speak, and what repercussions would come from bringing up the, you know, the the, the events of 2013. Um, so I, I, you know, to that point, Nick, to take such a emphasis on his life, his story, his death, and not, and, and actively choose not to speak to those closest to him, I think is, you know, another, another hole to kind of point out when they devote this kind of time to the story. And just one of the few criticisms that I've had of this documentary so far. Yeah, that's very interesting because most people feel as though, this is being presented and things being presented from a Robert Kraft standpoint, and it's all directed in, the, in, in I guess, the direction of Bill Belichick. It, it's, not as, it's not as ham-fisted as Last Dance was with Michael, right? Like, they're doing a right. better job of that, but yet I understand where you're coming from. Yeah, and look, even at the end, Robert Kraft said that they made a mistake, right? He, 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 he acknowledged that there was something done wrong on his part. He didn't say exactly what, but he did acknowledge some kind of wrongdoing. So this was a dark cloud over the Patriots organization and the organization who had already dealt with um, Spygate. Then it was the Flategate. And then you had this whole thing with, you know, Aaron Hernandez. And it made a lot of individuals around the league who were fans of other teams take a deeper, closer look at what was considered to be the Patriot way and trying to understand what does it mean to be a Patriot? He's Nick Ferguson. I'm Alex Hardy. Those are episodes five and six of Dynasty, celebrating the Patriots' rise and downfall um, through their 20 years of success with Tom Brady, with Bill Belichick, neither of whom were featured in episode six. So, As we continue to discuss this um, documentary, I want to remind you that you can find us, those guys, wherever you get your podcasts, um, on Apple Podcasts and on YouTube. If you want to take a look at us, if you're listening, you can see our reactions uh, and and just watch the furrowed brow I have when criticizing, you know, what I've seen in this last episode. But make sure to be here this time next week. We'll be handling episodes seven and eight. And for those of you that 
um, want to catch up on the news around the NFL, prepare for the draft, you can listen to those guys. We, we tackle the NFL topics at large. Um, so feel free to check us if you're interested in the Patriots, this documentary, or if you just want your general NFL news, some topics that we like to throw around, especially with the perspective of Nick Ferguson, former NFL safety. Uh, you can follow him at Nick Ferguson underscore 25. He's been grinding tape, getting ready for the NFL draft, looking at top quarterbacks, um, and really just residing with the fact that Jarrett Stidham will be the Broncos quarterback come week one. So um, I'm looking forward to uh, seeing you again, Nick. And until next time for Dynasty Documentary, what do you have for the people? Keep your eyes on your luggage. Peace.